All right, so let's check out practice 12.2. And we've got our first function here. And the reason I want to choose this one to start off with, this is a little different than we saw in the uh, lecture video, is that we're going to do the same thing here, is we're going to break this down into an F times a G. And we can also do this with parentheses. So we can call this first parentheses F times this second parentheses G. And so that means we're going to define F to be X plus 7. And we're going to define G then to be 5 square root of X. The square root of X means X to the half plus 8. And then once we have these two functions, we will then take their derivatives. So the derivative of X is 1. The derivative of a constant is 0. And over here, we have another power function. So the 1 half will drop down times 5. We subtract 1 from the exponent. And the derivative of a constant is 0. So we have all four pieces. And now we'll put them in. To the product rule. So we have F, we have G prime plus F prime, which is one times G. And that's our answer. And now we'll do our best to clean it up. And there's really not much we can do here to make this look any better. So our best looking answer here that's it. Now if you wanted, you could also change this back to a square root. So minus one half means one over square root of x. And then one half just means regular old square root of x. So if you wanted to, you could also write it back in terms of uh, square root of x. And I am choosing square root here just because it's a little bit easier to enter because you just have to hit the square root button here versus uh, doing the exponent to power half. And there's question one. So moving on to the next one here. Now the first thing you want to notice is that there's division this time. So we got our division bar, which means then we're going to be using the quotient rule. Now it turns out that the book um, gives a lot of quotient rules, not as many product rules. So a lot of quotient rules here going forward. So we can recognize the entire numerator as F, the entire denominator as G, and that's how we set those definitions. Now that we have f and g, we will get their derivatives. So the derivative of 5x is 5. The derivative of minus 6 is 0. The derivative of 4x is 4. And the derivative of 5 is 0. We now have all four of our pieces. And so we can just plug them in to the quotient rule. So we have F prime times G minus 
F times G prime all over G squared. And then we'll do our best to clean this up. Now in this case, there's um, gonna be like terms if we distribute this out, which means they'll subtract out. So I'm just gonna distribute out the numerator here. So five into the parentheses there. And then I'm gonna do a minus four into this parentheses. And that's all over. 4x plus 5 squared. So we see we have some uh, like terms that'll cancel. So 20x minus 20x, those will subtract out. And so we're left with 49 over 4x plus 5 squared. And that's our derivative. So we have another quotient rule here. And how do we know that? Well, it's the it's division. You can see there's a division bar there. And so that's telling us we have a numerator divided by a denominator. And this defines f and g for us. So we're saying f is 3 minus 3x minus 7 and g is 7x plus 3. Now that we've defined f and g, we need those derivatives. So the derivative of 3x is 3. The derivative of minus 7 is 0. The derivative of 7x is 7. And the derivative of 3 is 0. So we have all four of our pieces. And now that we have all four of our pieces, we'll plug them into the quotient rule. So we have f prime times g minus f times g prime. And that's all over g squared. Now again, um, because we just have constants and x to the power of 1 in the numerator here, means if we distribute this all out, we're going to be able to gather like terms. And so that's something we're going to want to do here to clean this up. So distributing the 3 into the parentheses, distributing the minus 7 into this parentheses, and that's all over. 7x plus 3 squared. So the numerator, 21x minus 21x will subtract out. And so we have 9 plus 49 to get us our final cleaned up answer. Use the quotient rule to find the derivative. Oh, they're actually telling us here. I didn't even notice that. The problem is saying use the quotient rule. So we have, now I know it's saying that, but of course it's good to know why we're using the quotient rule here because we have a function divided by a function. This defines f and g, so we're saying f is the numerator and g is the denominator. Once we've made those definitions, we need their derivatives. So the derivative of x squared is 2x. The derivative of 4 is 0. The derivative of x is 1, and the derivative of minus 1 is 0. We have all four pieces. And now we can plug them in to the quotient rule. So we have f prime 
times G minus F times G prime. I'm just going to write this in here to be clear. G prime is 1 all over G squared. Now it turns out, since we have a 2x and another x here, this will be x squared, which will combine with this x squared. So we do have some like terms in the numerator that we can clean up. And so we'll distribute all that in the numerator. And so we have 2x squared minus x squared to get us just a x squared minus 2x minus 4 all over x minus 1 squared. And there's potentially one more thing to do now because we have this quadratic up here, which you've learned a lot in algebra, may can be factored. And you should check that because the factor might cancel a denominator which means that's more simplification. And you do want the most simplified answer here. So let's just check this out. Is it possible that we can get a factor here? Well, to get four is a one and a four, uh, but a one and a four certainly won't get us this two. Now the other possibility is a two and a two here to get four, but two and a two won't get us a two here. So in other words, there's no way one of these factors will be x minus 1. There's no way any of these factors will be x minus 1, which means there's no further cancellation that will take place, which means then this is our final simplified answer. Let's check out number five. So again, another quotient rule. Now I know they're telling us that, but you should be able to identify that by, you, by there being division here. So we'll define this entire numerator as F, the entire denominator as G and then we'll just explicitly write that out. Once we've done that, we need these derivatives. So the derivative of x squared is 2x. The derivative of minus 8x is minus 8. And the derivative of 1 is 0. The derivative of x squared is 2x and the derivative of three is zero. We now have all four pieces, and we'll plug them in to the quotient rule. So f prime, two x minus eight, g, x squared plus three, minus, f x squared minus 8x plus 1 and g prime 2x. This is all over g squared. And there is potential for the numerator to have like terms that cancel out. And so we're going to want to clean that numerator up, which means we are going to have to distribute all of this stuff out. So 2x into this parentheses here. Minus 8 into the parentheses. And then we have minus 2x going into this parentheses.
and this is all over G squared. And now we'll gather like terms and hope this cleans up. So for x cubed, we have positive and negative. So those are gone. They subtract out. And that's it. So the rest will have to combine. So minus 8x squared plus 16x squared will get us an 8x squared. 6x minus 2x is plus 4x. And then all that's left then is the minus 24. And this is all over x squared plus 3. Now, in the numerator, there is a greatest common factor of 4. And now, at this point, you may be wondering, well, should we check the factoring of this quadratic here? And yes, you should always check it, because you want to see if one of these factors will divide out the denominator because you want to check that you are in the most simplified form. However, you know if you factor this quadratic, if you factor the quadratic, it's going to be an x and an x. None of these factors will have an x squared. So we can conclude this is the simplest, the simplified form. It's in the simplest form because no matter what this factors into, it will never have an x squared in it. So there's no more division. Everything is simplified, and that is our final answer. Number six, another quotient rule. So as I mentioned earlier, the uh, book at my math lab really liked the quotient rule. A lot of examples of the quotient rule. Now the big difference here is they're going to use P and T, so different letters, to try to uh, see if that messes you up at all instead of using F and X. And another thing they're going to do here is throw you the square root of t. Now, hopefully from algebra, you remember the square root sign means power half. The square root function is a power function. And because we have division here, means we're going to use the quotient rule. So we're defining f to be t to the half. And we're find, defining g to be 2t minus 9. Once we've made those definitions, we want their derivatives. So t to a half. The half will drop down and become the coefficient. And then we subtract 1 from the exponent. 2t as a derivative of 2. And the derivative of a minus 9 is 0. We have all four pieces. And we'll plug them into the quotient rule. So we have f prime times g minus f times g prime. And that's all over g squared. So now that we have everything here, we'll try our best to clean this up. And there is 
not much we can do here. So the only thing that I might do is, um, the only thing I would really change is the two because it's pretty common to have your constants written first. So the only change I would do here in writing the simplified answer is just change the T to the this position here. Besides that, there's no more simplifying. Uh, there's no greatest common factor. That is our best answer. Now, for my math lab, a little bit easier to use the square root symbol. So remember, t to the minus half means 1 over square root of t. And t to the half means square root of t. Number seven, use the quotient rule, okay? So now we're back to x's again. So we have four x plus five, and the square root of x is x to a half. Now, I wanna say something like this with this one, that like many things in math, there are different starting points. So we could decompose this into fractions. Now you may ask, why would you do that? Well, because once we decompose it into fractions like this, we don't need the quotient rule anymore. Now this isn't always true. Uh, it happens sometimes like this one. So x divided by x to a half is 4x to the half plus 5x to the minus half. We no longer have functions being divided. They're now being added, which means the derivative distributes, and so there's no longer a quotient rule here. We could do that route. So if we take this derivative, the half will drop down. 4 times a half is 2. And we subtract 1 from the exponent. And over here, to taking the derivative, the minus 1 half will drop down and hit the 5. And we subtract 1 from the exponent. So we have minus half, minus 1, to get us a minus 3 halves. And now if we look at the answers here that they're given, A, B, C, and D, uh, you can see none of them look like this. And I can't tell you exactly why my math lab chooses things it does, but my math lab tends to dislike negative exponents, which is why in your choices A, B, C, and D, you see no negative exponents. And so to get one of their answers, we're going to have to do that. Now, I know it doesn't say anywhere, don't use negative exponents. Um, I'm just telling you that's something about my math lab. They just, they don't like negative exponents. So let's rewrite this. So as I said in, last, in the last problem, x to the minus half, it means uh, 1 over square root of x. And over in this position here, we have x to the minus 3 halves. Now remember, minus 3 halves, remember what this equals. This equals 3 times minus a half. And minus a half means 1 over square root of x. Now the 3 
is actually the power. And this is always true for exponents. The numerator of the exponent, this three in this case, always represents the power, so x cubed, and the denominator of the exponent always represents your root. So there's a two here, which means square root. If there was, say, a five here, that would mean the fifth root, where you write a little five into the little nook there. So here's our answer without positive exponents. And if we look, this still is not one of our uh, solutions they're giving us. And so we have to play around with this more and try to get one of these forms they're looking for. Now, how can we do that? Well, um, if you notice, all of these have a common denominator. And that's suggesting to us we should get a common denominator for these. So that means we have to multiply this. We need to get the same denominator over here. So we're going to need a 2 in here and a square root of x squared. So that square root of x times square root of x squared is square root of x cubed. So 2 times 2 is 4 times square root of x squared. And then for this next one, this is already our common denominator. And so now we can write this all together. Now square root of x squared is just x. And so now we've written it all together with a common denominator. And now if we look at our solutions, we can see that B is looking pretty close. It's got the 4x minus 5. However, the denominator is not written exactly how I have it written. And that's because x cubed, let me write this over here actually. x cubed, remember, x cubed is x squared times x. And remember from properties of exponents, we can break this apart. And the square root of x squared is x. And so that means the square root of x cubed is equal to x square root of x. And so we can replace that. x square root of x cubed is x square root of x. And now we see that it is definitely then answer b. So... This one's a little bit more work because my math lab is only giving us a specific form that we have to work towards. And that's our answer. So I think the biggest hint there was that they all have a common denominator. And so that's what was telling us then that we had to add these terms together. So check out number eight. Ah, finally, another product. So we have y equals x to the eighth e to the x. Now there's no division here. Now there's multiplication. And multiplication means we will then use the product rule. So we're going to define f to be the power function and g to be the exponential function. Once we've made those definitions, we will find their derivatives. So the derivative of eight, uh, x to the eighth is eight x to the seventh, and the derivative of e to the x is itself. And now that we have all four pieces, we can put them into 
the product rule. So F is X to the eighth. G prime is E to the X. F prime is eight X to the seventh and G is E to the X. Now there's no common terms here. There's no uh, gathering like terms. These are different terms. However, there is a greatest common factor so both of these terms have at least seven x's, and they all have an e to the x. That is the greatest common factor. And what's left over then in the parentheses is x plus 8. And again, you can always distribute that to check it out, make sure it's the same thing. So number nine. Now, this one I noticed, uh, they have an absolute value written on the log, and that is not something I stated in the lecture video, so I'll state this now, that the log function is unique in that the derivative of the absolute value is the same thing as without the absolute value. Um, I have an equal sign here. That is not right. I, what I'm saying is the derivative, these derivatives are the same. This is something that's true with the log function, that the absolute value has the same derivative as without the absolute value. And that is 1 over t. So just again, because I didn't say this in the lecture video, that the derivative of natural log is 1 over t. The derivative of the natural log of the absolute value of t is the same thing. It's 1 over t. So that's what we're going to end up using for this problem because now they're telling us S is T to the 8 log absolute value of T. So we have multiplication here, which means we're going to use a product rule that defines F and G. Now that we have f and g, we will get those derivatives. So the derivative of t to the eighth is eight t to the seventh. And as I just got done saying, the log of the absolute value of t is the same thing as the other natural log, one over t. Now that we have our four pieces, we will stick them in to the product rule. So we have F, um, whoops, I put the prime there on F, I meant to put that prime on, I got these primes backwards, my mistake there, F G prime plus F prime G. And so F is T to the eight. G prime is one over T plus F prime and then times G. We'll do our best to clean this up. So T to the eighth divided by T is T to the seventh. And there is a greatest common factor here now of T to the seventh. And so we'll factor that out to get our final answer.
And the last one, and now a good thing to, I was just about to say what these functions are, but a good thing to do right off the bat is can you identify the functions we have here? So we have an exponential function times a log function. Since it's times, it's multiplication, means we're using the product rule. And so then we're explicitly stating that f is 3 raised to the x and g is log base 3 of x. Once we've made those definitions, we need to get those derivatives. So the derivative of 3 to the x is natural log of 3 times 3 to the x. And the derivative of log base 3 is 1 over natural log 3 times x. Once we have our four pieces, we will plug them in to the product rule. So f is 3 to the x. g prime is 1 over natural log of 3 times x plus f prime which is natural log of 3 times 3 to the x and then times g which is log base 3. So we'll do our best to clean this up. Uh, there's actually no simplifying or canceling that happens here. There's no like terms. However, there is a greatest common factor of 3 to the x. And that's our best looking answer. Now, to get the correct base on log here, we're going to have to go for the superscript over here to get that in the base 3. And there is practice 12.2.